also like to start by thanking the ASB, um, past President Haas, who organized all of the awards, as well as everyone involved in um, choosing the award winners for honoring me with this today. I also want to start and make sure to thank everybody who's helped me along my academic journey. This includes Wendy Murray, who is my PhD advisor and taught me to love the wrist and hand, and Andy Anderson, who is my postdoc advisor, who taught me that the foot and ankle might almost be as cool as the wrist and hand. And one of the scary things about my talk today is that neither Wendy nor Andy are actually on the abstract that I um, am presenting which means I have the exciting opportunity to share with you some of the new directions I'm taking my research as a very new assistant professor at the University of Florida. So, as I just mentioned, I started at the wrist and hand, I moved to the foot and ankle, and I've kind of, one of the first projects I'm going back to is saying, well, let's go back to some of those questions I had as a graduate student that I get a, didn't get an opportunity to answer. So I want you to take a second and think about your wrist and your thumb. Now at the simplest, in this lateral pinch posture that I'm showing here, you're controlling six degrees of freedom. So you have joint angles, two at the wrist, four across the thumb, in order to produce some sort of force vector holding that key. That's nine variables. And I don't know about you, but I don't think very well in nine dimensional space. <laughs> now the problem is, if you know Wendy's work, she's a musculoskeletal modeler, so she taught me that simulations are super cool. So as soon as you say, oh, it's a nine-dimensional space, and then you say, oh, I'm going to add in muscles, and I'm going to simulate it, suddenly I have all of those bones, I have muscle and tendon, I have ligaments and soft tissue, and I have all of that complex dynamics that we know so well as biomechanists regarding how all those things interact together. So now my conservative estimate of the number of parameters I would comfortably be willing to change in this model are around 109. Now, what this shows us is biomechanics problems are complicated. They involve lots and lots of parameters. And the problem I'm going to talk to you about today is just that nine dimensional space, because if I can't think in nine dimensions, how am I going to think in 109 dimensions? And I'm going to talk to you about an approach that I think you've been hearing the term a lot in various ways in this meeting, which is machine learning. Machine learning offers us the ability to look at these multi-parameter spaces. And one of my primary goals in my talk to you today is to teach you that machine learning is not magic. It is not a magic black box that you don't have the ability to understand. And I'm actually going to spend a, quite a bit of time in my talk actually showing you what machine learning looks like. My second goal today is to tell you about two of the applications that I think are most important in machine learning. And I'm not the first on either of these, but I um, have the opportunity to share my opinions today. The first one is that we can use machine learning to predict pathology or clinical outcomes. And I'm going to pause here and tell you a little bit about the problem I'm going to talk about, which is I'm going to talk about how we can use machine learning to classify someone with a non-impaired wrist versus one of two surgeries for wrist osteoarthritis. And you'll notice here I'm calling them surgery one and surgery two, because this is really a broad general just sample problem that says we can classify pathological conditions versus non-impaired conditions. And these two surgeries, clinically, according to the literature, are exactly identical on functional outcome scores. And I'm going to show you that even when you have really similar things like that, you can still start to see differences in that pathology. The second application that I actually find really interesting um, and I'm a little bit more excited on is that you can facilitate biomechanical analyses. I had a really interesting discussion with a senior um, researcher here that said, I really like my intuition better than machine learning. Well, I think as a senior researcher, his intuition might be a little bit better than mine. So I really like the idea of using some of these tools to help guide that intuition and make sure we're not bringing our own predetermined biases into our analysis. So the next couple slides are going to walk you through the sample problem that I want to talk about, as well as how machine learning can be applied. So this is the problem. Take a sample of the population and say everybody in that population either has a healthy wrist, a wrist following the first surgery, or a wrist following the second surgery. I want to be able to take one person, measure things that are easy to measure, like their lateral pinch strength and maybe the position of their joints. I want to be able to put that into a machine learning algorithm and actually be able to tell you, did I randomly choose somebody that had the risk surgery or one that did not? And then I also want to be able to tell you what was important about that measurement that actually made me be able to determine that um, scenario. And everything I'm showing you to today is a simulation data. 
because machine learning requires lots of data. And as a new faculty member, I'm still working through all that paperwork to actually be able to take data from human subjects. So let's talk a little bit about how we can use simulations to generate data. So I used an OpenSim model and did 165 lateral pinch simulations using forward dynamics. This represents 33 models representing 11 different sizes, as well as those three conditions, the two surgeries, as well as the non-impaired state. And I varied our muscle activation so that I could have different varieties of force generation, ranging from about 10 newtons to 50 newtons. I then calculated endpoint force and, those, and joint posture. So those are our key output variables. And I don't have the time to go into it today, but these are dynamic simulations. So every simulation contains 800 to 1400 time points. So this is one of the ways that you can get lots of data. And there's some nuances to how we can use machine learning effectively with time series data. So these things, the thumb force and the joint posture, are what goes into our machine learning. And they're called features. This is one of the fun things when you start learning and working with collaborators. You have to start learning each other's language. We've been working on this project for about um, nine months now, and I think we finally defined the term parameter in, in the same way. So when it, you take these machine learning inputs, and you have 165 simulations. So I have a three-dimensional um, force vector, as well as um, joint angles describing six degrees of freedom. So what the machine learning algorithm is supposed to be able to do is take data from one simulation. So this is like taking one random person. Put it into your machine learning algorithm, and then figure out which of these three categories or classes is the um, machine learning term you fall into. And I want to highlight that I'm, we did three machine learning, um, different kinds of machine learning. We did support vector machines, random forests, and deep neural networks. And for those of you that were in the joint Im imaging um, symposium this morning, I think um, David Lloyd did a really good job of saying there's a lot of different varieties of machine learning out there. And one of the hard things when you start a new question is figuring out which one's right. So going into this, we were like, we don't know what's right. Let's try a bunch and see what happens. So I want to spend about the next two and a half to three minutes and give you a crash course in machine learning. And the goal of this is to really show you that conceptually, all, everybody in this room has the ability to understand machine learning. And you could understand the math, too. You just can't do that in three minutes. So what, what we did is called supervised machine learning. To be supervised, you need training data. So you collect a bunch of data. You train your system to generate these features, and then you learn kind of how, those, um, how to split things into different categories. You then take a different set of data to do your testing, generate these features, and apply your decision boundaries in order to separate your categories. And when they talk about learning, what you're really learning is these decision boundaries. How do I separate things into classes? And I'm going to walk through the three methods we use so you can see that different techniques do this in different ways. So the first one support vector machines. This is called a maximum margin classifier, which is a big scary word, but all it means is that if I took two features, and I'm going to demonstrate everything in two-dimensional space, because you can see two-dimensional space, but I can also do this in nine dimensions, 100 dimensions, as many dimensions as your computer is big enough to handle. So I'm plotting two features versus each other, and the goal here is to separate the orange dots from the blue dots. The maximum margin classifier is going to define the maximum margin between them, which in this case could be done by a straight line. But as I said, you can do this with multiple features. You can also do this with different kinds of curves. So you could do this with a um, parabolic curve or really any type of curve that math will allow you to define. So that's the first method. The second method is called random forests. Here you get to choose a random set of features and divide that using something called a decision tree. So again, I'm showing you an example. I have two features, and I'm trying to separate the blue dots and the orange dots. And I draw something that ha called my root node that has all of my data in it. Then I say, I'm going to draw a random line based on one of those features. And I'm going to classify whether it's higher than that line. I'm going to say, well, most of those are orange, so I'm going to call that orange. Most of the ones below it are blue. I'm going to call that blue. And if I keep drawing lines at different spaces and classifying whether there are more blue dots or orange dots on either side of my line, I can gradually build a tree so that I can separate my two categories. The power of random forests is that I can build lots and lots of trees. And I can do this with two features or nine features or as many features as I want. And then it kind of becomes a democracy. Every tree gets to vote on what color it thinks a dot is. So if I have four trees and three of them thinks it's blue and one of them thinks it's orange, then your machine learning algorithm is going to say, that's a blue dot. The majority said so. So 
That's random farts. And then the last one is deep neural networks. And this is one I think we're hearing a lot about in recent years. It's one of the um, more new things. And this is just solving an inverse problem. We know how to solve inverse problems as biomechanists. And this is saying if I have input layers defining my features and output layers defining my classes, how can I find the math between them? And the only thing, I always thought deep meant that it was like really cool and complicated. Deep just means that you put more than one layer in between them. So you made your math a little bit more complicated. And there's a lot of decisions to go into how you actually um, decide how many layers are there. And then you have to connect those layers and solve the complicated math behind them. So I hope this gives you a little bit of a taste of three different um, machine learning methods. And I also want to point out to you, I presented them in chronological order. Support vector machines have been around for well over 20 years. Deep neural networks, neural networks have been around for a long time. The deep part's the part that's really new. And I'm gonna throw up this information because I'm guessing there's about three people in the room that care about these parameters. <laughs> and the real thing that I wanna highlight here is as we become more and more interdisciplinary, and that's something we love doing as biomechanists, you need to realize that you need to find the people that know how to do what you wanna do. Because just like when we do really complicated statistics problems, we find statist statisticians to consult with, when you solve a really complicated machine learning problem, you want someone that knows what all these parameters are and can help you figure out which ones to choose. So let's go back to that problem and say, let's actually see some results. So we're answering two questions. How accurately do each of these classify the three conditions, the non-impaired and the two surgeries? And then which of these features is actually most important during this classification? So to define accuracy, we did cross-validation. And if you ever read a machine learning paper, I strongly encourage you to look for the term cross-validation in it. This is one of the places that machine learning literature um, can get a little fuzzy. Just like when you read a finite element paper, you want to look for a validation. So you, in cross-validation, you take data, you take some percentage of your data and train with that data. And then you take separate, independent data that was not used in your training set and use that for testing. The 20-fold part means that we did this 20 times, and then we summed those accuracies to say, okay, with different random sets of data, how are we doing? What's kind of the range of accuracy we can expect? And the graph that we got, I was a little disappointed in because it's really boring to look at. So I am plotting <laughs> the three machine learning algorithms versus accuracy, where one represents maxim maximum accuracy. And what you instantly see is given all nine of these features, they have a really high accuracy. And when your collaborator comes to you and says, oh, everything's better than 0.96, you're like, no, that can't be true. You did something wrong. I don't believe you. And so we did a bunch of things to try to kind of convince me that this might be right. One of them is to use different amounts of features. So if you use one feature, you should expect your accuracy to go down. As you add features, it increases. And you can see that going from dark to light here. Less features give us less accuracy, more features give us more accuracy. But you also see that only one feature does pretty well. And that seems a little suspicious too. So we did something in order to look at how well, if we only use one feature, how well does that do? And what we actually discovered was that no one feature accurately classifies all three of these classes. So this is a lot of data to look at at once. It's those nine features on the x-axis versus what's called a binary accuracy on the y-axis. And what you're seeing in the black bars is that this is the accuracy of identifying the non-impaired state versus the other two. That's why it's a binary accuracy. We're only classifying two things. So blue is surgery one versus the other two conditions. And that minimum line at 0.66 is your accuracy due to random chance. And if you look across all of the features, you see that every single feature has one thing that's really close to just random chance. So not a single one of these features is good enough on its own to classify these three things. But it does beg the question, well, which features do I need? Do I need all of them? Can I use this information in order to inform my biomechanical analyses? So again, we have nine features, and the most influential features can be identified using random forests. I don't have time to go into this math today, but trust me on that, and I'm happy to answer questions on it later. Now, I wish we had time that I could take everybody that is involved in the hand and wrist and have them vote on like, what features they think are going to be the most important. But I came into this having studied these wrist surgeries for my entire PhD, and the conclusion of my dissertation is that wrist flexion extension and radial ulnar deviation are really big, important differences between these surgeries. 
And if I had to rank them, I'd say flexion extension is going to be number one. That's going to be the big thing. Radial ulnar deviation is going to be a close follow-up. Well, what Random Forest told me is a deviation is a winner, and the other one is carpal metacarpal abduction. And we just did surgeries on the wrist, and I'm telling you that one of the most important features is the CMC joint in the thumb, which was not touched by surgery during this um, event. And what this does is it, the important thing is machine learning doesn't tell you why these are important. That's on you to figure out what the important um, interpretation is. So it caused me to go back to some of the data I had and said, what, do, what is this actually explaining? What I saw is that radial ulnar deviation is actually distinguishing the non-impaired versus the surgical states. And I actually realized I had the data to support this idea. I'd done a moment arm study during my um, predoctoral years that showed that one of the surgeries really affected radial ulnar deviation moment arms. And I'd done a simulation study that said the other surgery actually affects radial ulnar deviation position, at least in this simulation scenario. So that is a good indication of why radial ulnar deviation is important. And then when I looked at CMC abduction, I said, okay, why, why is that important? And I discovered that the simulation data set actually showed important differences in CMC abduction that we don't actually talk about in our paper, which is a good indication that says these kinds of methods of looking at multi-parameter spaces can make you reevaluate your data, look at it in a different way, realize that you have biases that you bring to this laboratory and your scientific interpretation and give you an unbiased approach that says the computer doesn't have a bias or at least the computer's bias is different than yours and might lead to a different result. So I hope that what you learned today is a little bit about machine learning, and I encourage you to go um, learn more from your colleagues if you're interested in that. I hope I showed you that we are moving towards being able to use these techniques to predict pathologies and identify and classify different conditions. And I realize I showed the post-surgical state, but you can imagine how this is going to be useful in a um, diagnostic setting. And I also showed that you, this can really facilitate our biomechanical analyses. And to give you just a taste of where um, my lab's going, we have two key future directions. The first one is can we learn from more features? We solved a relatively easy machine learning problem with only nine features. And I really want to push it and say, can we use that to look at this entire multidimensional space? And the second one that my collaborator is really interested in is it takes a lot of time for us to generate experimental data. How can we leverage simulations to train our machine learning and then use that to actually predict things in our experiments? So how can we actually um, use that and couple that together? So I, with that, I'd like to thank everybody in my um, past and present who has helped me get to where I am today, and I'll take any questions.